one of the oldest nations in the world, and an enemy of the United States. Iran, a modern-day theocracy with a large economy that's centrally controlled. Since 1979, Iran has opposed most of America's allies in the Middle East, seizing every opportunity to fund opposing factions within their nations, with a state ideology that sees the United States as the Great Satan. A country's leadership has always been pathologically wary of having to face a military confrontation against this Satan. Part of their preparatory arsenal has recently included hypersonic missiles, a development that has alarmed U.S. military leadership. How did Iran come to acquire hypersonic missiles? And what's their overall strategy? Let's learn about it. Armed to the teeth. Hypersonic missile technology, as you're aware, is relatively new missile tech. It's been developed off the back of decades of research and development towards subsonic and supersonic missile technology. By definition, these are missiles that travel at least 6,174 kilometers per hour, or five times the speed of sound. So far, they have found use in targeting critical enemy infrastructure before they can be intercepted. Naturally, for Iran, this is the most sought-after advantage. Without much in the way of sophisticated air power or combined arms capabilities, they believe this is the way to go to achieve strategic goals. The United States Institute of Peace highlights Iran as having the largest and most diverse ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. That's surely some high praise. Among similarly belligerent neighbors, Iraq and Pakistan, and among the wider Middle East region, Iran is one of the first to recognize the benefits of ballistic missiles on the strategic field. Back when Iran was ruled by the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, they were allied to the US. During this time, the MGM-52 Lance ballistic missile was denied to him. Thus, Project Flower was born, and Iran would begin its indigenous solution. What the Shah primarily wanted was to have enough options for conducting deep strikes into enemy territory, and both Iraq and Syria were shaping up to be those enemies. For that, Iran already had a robust air force, and consequently, Project Flower didn't receive much in the way of funding. And then he was overthrown in 1979 by the current theocratic regime. Iran's foreign policy alignment changed overnight, while old enemies still remained. Eight years of war against Iran, from 1980 to 1988, depleted all of their deep strike capabilities, as without Western spare parts, planes slowly fell apart. Turning to the Soviet Union, they acquired Scud missiles to make do during the war, and the Iranian missile program would officially get its start from here. They modified the Scud design to suit their needs, creating the Shahed, Qiyam, Gator, and Emma designs. These designs that are considered to be truly Iranian originals, capable of highly accurate strikes in medium to long-range attack profiles. Part of the reason the regime was able to rapidly improve their capabilities was in part due to secret cooperation with North Korea, famous for having the technical know-how for developing some rather serious ballistic missiles. Already sanctioned by much of the Western world, Iran had no qualms collaborating with another similarly sanctioned state. At the time of the unveiling of the Fatah hypersonic missile, Iran is estimated to have around 3,000 ballistic missiles in its arsenal, a number which increases greatly if cruise missiles are also added in proportion to the country's size, budget, and industrial capacity. It's absolutely armed to the teeth and ready to threaten all of the United States regional allies, especially Israel facing Fatah, Israel's missile dilemma. In June 2023, residents of Iran's capital Tehran suddenly woke up to trilingual billboards adorning their city, 
prominently featuring the image of a missile. In Farsi, Arabic and Hebrew, the billboard reads 400 seconds to Tel Aviv. This is the Fatah missile, Iran's first indigenous hypersonic missile, coming off the back of decades of R&D under strict economic sanctions. It had been previously hinted in November 2022 by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, that they had a hypersonic missile, and the billboards were its first reveal. It is said to have a range of 1,400 kilometers or 870 miles, putting all of Israel and Saudi Arabia well within its sights. It's additionally capable of exceeding Mach 15 or 11.5 thousand miles per hour. It is also said to feature a movable secondary nozzle, something that allows for high maneuverability within and outside the atmosphere. If it's really functional and reliable, it could give the FATA the kind of maneuverability that could allow it to evade missile defense systems and reach its target. Indeed, the IRGC's top commanders have said that no missile defense system is a match for it and that they'll soon look forward to similar hypersonic missiles capable of exceeding the 2,000 kilometer range mark. Sounds huge. Sounds scary. Especially for Israel. But it seems not everyone is convinced. Amos Yadlin, a former head of the Israeli Military Intelligence Directorate, and an active player in the Israeli defense policy discussions has said. In our experience, there is a significant gap between its declarations and the actual performance of the systems it develops. It is hard to assume that the Iranians have overcome problems that the Americans are still facing, and it seems that the Iranians' use of the term hypersonics refers to the low end of the field. Moreover, Iranians are known to often prefer to shorten research and development processes and to compromise on performance for propaganda and strategic communication purposes. He has also said that the development of hypersonic missiles is not child's play. And even the world's premier superpowers, the US, China, and Russia have struggled greatly over the years with making a truly effective missile. Most famously, Russia's Kinzhal hypersonic missiles have failed to make much of a dent against Ukrainian air defense systems, running Cold War era MIM-104 Patriots, with the latter shooting down several Kinzhals en route to their targets. In simple terms, this likely means that FATA missiles may not find themselves reliably reaching their targets in Israel they may even fail to detonate or reach hypersonic speeds as intended. Other Israelis, however, such as researcher Tail Inbar, with the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance, instead suggests that there's not much reason to doubt the authenticity of the FATA. He notes how the demonstrative media that the Iranians released to announce the FATA's procurement shows a precision-guided strike at a target. This is something that they've proven themselves capable of doing, he explained. The most important part is the redesign of the re-entry vehicle. I have been watching since 1998. I never saw disinformation or lies about the missiles. In missiles, what we see is what they have, and no exaggeration in capabilities in range and speed. Uzi Rubin, founder and former director of the Israel Missile Defense Organization at the Israeli Defense Ministry, also believes that the missile is a real threat. The concept is realistic, elegant, and is workable, he told CNN, with the Saudis and Egyptians remaining quiet about it. Perhaps the consensus among Israelis is that they should take it seriously, but not panic. After all, if the Patriot can take down a Kinzhal, then the Iron Dome system can go a long way too. Iran's proxy missile strategy. As alluded to previously, Iran does not have an army, air force, or navy capable of power projection. A heavy sanctions regime was put in place long before Iran could develop a robust domestic arms industry. Due to the high costs associated with direct warfighting, Iran adopts an indirect approach to warfare. Engaging in wars by proxy, 
the country's forces, specifically the intelligence departments of the IRGC, employs other factions to fight on its behalf. Of course, this indirect strategy involves the use of ballistic missiles. Instead of directly targeting the enemy's military, Iran launches these missiles from another nation's territory, bypassing their defense systems and protective forces, and aiming at the rear of the enemy's populace and strategic assets. The introduction of hypersonic missiles raises the stakes significantly, while unrealistic at the moment. If they're able to find a way to mass-produce hypersonic missiles, they will become an elevated threat to all of its enemies. It's always said that countries that can't afford to have an air force superior to its enemies will opt for missiles. The second best option. An air force has more flexible firepower, but it is dependent on access to airfields, and its planes are vulnerable to air defenses. Missiles are a substitute. If airfields are threatened or when air superiority is unattainable. But allow us to think for a second that maybe missiles don't have to be a substitute. They can be the primary force for attacking, allowing their user to refuse to play the game in a way that would guarantee their defeat. Hypersonic missiles are being developed alongside drones and fast attack boats to give the Iranians real capacity to do serious damage to whoever the opponent may be. These also open up the opportunity to sell to non-state actors and state allies, such as Russia, who have already been buying the Shahedid attack drone. As for Israel, they'll have to constantly be on alert for when and if. Iran sells any of these weapons to the infamously heavily armed Hezbollah paramilitary group located just across the border in Lebanon. A new phase of escalation in the Middle East may be on the horizon.